and welcome to this President's Town Hall on the University Budget. Uh, my name is Brian Ullman. I'm the Associate Vice President for Marketing and Communications for the University. Uh, and uh, before we get started, I want to do some introductions on who will be joining us for this very important conversation. Uh, we have with us uh, President Daryl Pines, uh, Senior Vice President and Provost Marianne Rankin, uh, Vice President of Administration and Finance Carlo Colella, and Associate Vice Provost of Academic Affairs, Cindy Hale, and Assistant President and Chief of Staff, Michelle Eastman. All of these individuals will be available for question and answer when we get to that point. Before I turn it over to Daryl Pines for some introductory remarks, let me do a little bit of housekeeping items. We are very, very happy that you're joining us for this important conversation today, and we want to answer as many questions as possible. We got many questions in advance that we will ask, and you also have the opportunity to ask questions live. To ask a question, click on the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and then I will read and direct those questions to the appropriate person. So we hope that you participate in that way. Uh, this uh, webinar will also be recorded, so please note that. And closed captioning is also available. If you need closed captioning assistance, simply click on the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. With that, again, thank you very much for joining us. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the president of the University of Maryland, Daryl Pines. Thank you, Brian, and uh, welcome and good afternoon to the Maryland community and to our entire campus community. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today as we talk through our financial uh, situation at our university. It's an opportunity for you to learn about our financial situation, be able to ask questions and have feedback from those questions. As we work through this incredible year, 2020, living through two pandemics, uh, the coronavirus, and of course, the social unrest in our country. We we're also challenged with a third pandemic, which is the financial impact that the first two have had on our campus over the entire year that we've been in operation. I am grateful to still be your president, and I'm grateful for another opportunity to gather and convene you on another town hall about something that's very important to the future of our institution. Our institution, let me reassure you, is strong. It's strong financially is strong stably by the support from the, all of the stakeholders, state government, our research enterprise, and our uh, financial uh, fundraising uh, activities as well. So before I hand it over to Carlo Colella, our VP for Administration and Finance, for a brief presentation, I wanna remind all of you of the guiding principles that got us to where we are today. Number one, the university must protect the health and safety of its students, faculty, and staff. Number two, the university must protect the most vulnerable members of its community. Number three, the university must ensure the research and teaching mission. Number four, the university must permit flexibility in the implementation of its budget. Number five, the university must be fully transparent about its path forward. And number six, the university will execute a balanced approach to any budget reduction. So let's spend a little bit of time on number two. Again, I'll remind you, number two is the university must protect the most vulnerable members of its community. Certainly we have to look out for financial health, health across the entire institution. But please know that you have leaders in this institution thinking about members of our entire community who may be the most impacted by even a small change in their paychecks. I think you will see that our budgeting decisions and our process reflect the guiding principle of number two. We truly care about the health, safety, and financial well-being of our most vulnerable employees and most impacted employees at the University of Maryland. Our team cares so much about those employees that the senior leadership team, vice presidents, athletic director, and chief of staff will each take a 10% salary reduction to contribute to our financial shortfall. And I will take a 15% salary reduction to contribute to our financial So it looks like that we might have had some uh, internet connectivity problems in the president's office because I see that President Pines has frozen. Um, so we're gonna get back to his remarks uh, as soon as he can reconnect. 
Um, and at this point, uh, I think it's prudent for us to go to Carlo Colella. Uh, Carlo, uh, again, is the Vice President of Administration and Finance, uh, and he has a brief presentation uh, to share. Carlo, let's turn it over to you. Thank you, Brian, and uh, welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to spend a few minutes on a brief presentation. We'll go through budget um, status and measures that we are taking during these challenging fiscal times. Let me try and share my screen and make sure that that works successfully. Brian, are you seeing uh, yep. my screen? Looks, looks good, Carlo. Thank you. So the agenda for this brief presentation, we're gonna go over the principles for addressing our fiscal issues. And, President Pines was just enumerating some of those. So I'll just briefly cover some of the things he's already mentioned. Then we'll go through and talk about our projected FY21 fiscal situation. And most importantly, our tentative plans to address these shortfalls. So in the last few months, we've been working very hard to minimize the impact of the COVID financial uh, challenges presented to the university. And we've had a lot of uh, decisions to make and taken a lot of measures to mitigate the impact, the financial impact of these extraordinary times. So as President Pines was saying, our principles that we are adhering to, health and safety of our campus community members, protect the educational research missions, make decisions grounded in our values of equity and inclusion, provide timely and transparent communications, and take input from internal and external st stakeholders, which has been underway for several months, be responsible stu stewards of our financial resources and take strategic actions to reduce expenditures through a combination of both permanent and temporary uh, initiatives. The COVID situation is a challenging one, but it is uh, one of finite duration as was indicated by President Pines, the university is very strong and the future is very solid. We need to work together to get through this challenging time. Um, uh, lastly, in this, in this uh, bullet, we make sure to align our human and financial resources to support needed changes in operations. Some of the uh, many stakeholders that have been participating with us over the last several months include the Senate, uh, Senate Committee on University Finance, the Senate Executive Committee, the Fiscal Planning Task Force, members across the organization, and our partners at the University System of Maryland. So all of the, those inputs have been helping us put forward a path that we think protects the university in response to the financial challenge. Some of the things that we've been doing in the last several months, temporary measures included hiring freezes, eliminating discretionary expenditures, postponing um, important uh, renovation projects on campus, of course, travel restrictions. So there have been a number of belt tightening measures that have been in place for several months. And those are very helpful to deal with um, one-time financial challenges. More permanently, base budget cuts that are resulting from state reduction appropriation were distributed as part of our annual budgeting process. I'm going to take a minute to um, briefly, I know there's a lot of information on this chart, but I want to briefly outline the FY20 budget so that you can see sort of the major categories of revenues. So the pie chart here shows state appropriations of about 25% of our $2.25 billion budget. So that budget includes our research activity for FY20 uh, budgeted at 464 million and all other activity that we categorize as unrestricted at about 1.8 billion. So of this entire $2.2 billion budget, about a quarter of it is state appropriation. 
30% is in the category of tuition and fees. 14% is in auxiliary enterprises. So that's auxiliary activities. The important takeaway from this chart is to emphasize how highly dependent we are on revenues from state sources and from tuition and fees. Maryland, like all states, is facing a serious fi financial challenge. And since the state provides 25% of our funding and controls to some extent the tuition that we can charge, we are very closely connected to the state's financial position. We have received some federal funds for COVID related expenses, uh, and that's been very helpful, but has not uh, bridged the gap of the challenges that COVID has presented. So in terms of the uh, COVID impact forecasted for FY21, this chart identifies our forecast for the impact due to COVID in this fiscal year. So as you can see in aggregate, nearly $292 million as an estimated financial impact. That is broken up into sort of two major categories, what we refer to as state supported activities at just under $100 million, or about a third of the total impact, and about $193 million in what are called non-state supported activities, which include auxiliaries. So breaks down into about one third state supported, two thirds not state supported. Going through a few of these lines, the first category is the state general fund cut. So starting this fiscal year, we received a seven and a half percent state budget cut to our appropriations. So that is $44.5 million included. In addition to that, there was a cut in fringe benefits. So together, these two categories, and these are what I would characterize as base budget structural changes. So these are not one-time activities, but these are uh, ongoing. In the next category, we have tuition and fees, $49 million. So our um, requested budget for fiscal year 21 included a modest 2% tuition increase in part to support the unfunded mandatory inc cost increases that come through the year. The tuition increases and associated uh, fee increases were frozen at last year's levels, which meant that per, uh, in comparison to budget, we are nearly $41 million below our, um, our, our what's called our current services budget. In addition, our revenue estimates for enrollment have been reduced somewhat. Very pleased that the enrollment numbers uh, look uh, strong with regard to what we call headcount or number of enrollees. But the um, one of the financial consequences is there's more in-state uh, uh, students versus out-of-state and fewer graduate students and fewer international students. So there is a financial impact uh, even as we keep our enrollment numbers steady. By far the biggest category of um, financial impact on the revenue side is uh, our auxiliary activity. So these are our residence halls, our dining halls, our athletic programs, our shuttle operations, uh, recreation, and so forth. So these activities in normal times are all supported with uh, fees and uh, external revenues. With the de-densification of the campus, with reductions in activities, and with some what we hope are conservative forecasting uh, planning for contingencies, we've estimated this impact at $169 million. Lastly, on this page, a um, uh, couple of other categories amounting to $27 million. So there are uh, additional expenses to the university uh, to deal with COVID. As I mentioned earlier, we've had some federal relief, but our expenses to heighten our uh, activities for COVID are and, and additional PP&E and additional cleaning and so forth, preparation for our online um, curriculum, they, they exceed the amount of uh, reimbursement that we've gotten for some of those costs. 
So that, um, those miscellaneous uh, additional costs, both in the state supported side and the non-state supported side amount in total to about $27 million. So in aggregate, what I would say is the, the problem, quote unquote, we're solving for is just under $292 million. So this chart, again, is the university budget, but in this case, it's on the expense side of the house. So uh, the $2.25 billion budget, previously we looked at the revenue side of this, and now we're looking at the expense side of this. And the, the big takeaway here with, I mean, this information is all uh, very important, but you can see the, the largest part by, by far of our expense budget is our salary and fringe benefits. So nearly two thirds of our expenditures on campus are related to salary and fringes. So when we have financial challenges, it's very difficult to address those fully without impacting in some way salary and fringe benefits. So I wanna just step back for uh, a minute to recall uh, the last time we had a, a budget challenge, which uh, at the time, about five years ago, seemed pretty significant, but obviously a lot less than uh, what we're dealing with today. So in fiscal year 15, we received a $15.6 million um, cut that was comprised of four and a half million dollars in permanent or structural cuts and about $11 million in temporary or one-time cuts. So that $15.6 million was the budget challenge we had a few years ago. How we solve that in fiscal year 15. For the permanent cuts, we were able to adjust the tuition to offset some of that um, loss in permanent revenue. So about a million and a half dollars went uh, towards that four and a half million dollar cut. And then there were some efficiencies and some uh, targeted layoffs that happened or eliminations of vacant positions that happened back then. So the permanent um, challenge that we had in terms of budget reduction was addressed with permanent measures. The temporary or one-time, what we call one-time uh, challenges were addressed with one-time solutions. Part of that included a uh, surcharge, a tuition surcharge for a one-year period of time. So that was about two and a half million dollars. And then some furloughs uh, at that time that uh, was able to uh, realize about $3 million in savings and some use of uh, fund balance at that time. So together, these were uh, one, all of these are one-time measures to deal with the one-time challenge of $11.1 million. So that's how we addressed the problem uh, a few years ago. So I thought it was helpful to offer this by way of sort of context setting. So the current plan to address what we have now is a fiscal year 21 forecasted shortfall um, is aimed at uh, addressing the $292 million uh, challenge I, I outlined previously. Um, I want to go through these in some detail and I want to underscore that this is our uh, current financial situation. We have worked very, very hard with the campus to minimize the impact and we are very um, pleased that at this point in time, we've been able to mitigate this with minimal impact to our employees. The future is uncertain um, with this crisis and the future outlook for state funding is challenging. So. I think what we'll go through today will be um, good news for most of our employees, the largest majority of our employees. But I want to underscore that this COVID situation is far from over. Um, the long-term prospects are very good, but when this virus is under control and when the impact of that is in the rearview mirror uh, remains to be seen. So in this $292 million challenge, I wanted to maybe start here at the bottom and say of that, about a quarter of it, $68 million, is uh, addressed through permanent actions. 
And about three quarters of it, $223 million, is being uh, addressed through temporary actions. Temporary actions include, for example, fund balance use. Being good stewards for many years, we were able to have some reserves, call them rainy day funds if you'd like, to be able to weather these challenging times. So over half of the uh, impact that we're having to address, we are proposing to use fund balance. We had um, part of this is in um, support of the Board of Regents. The annual fund balance growth goal has been uh, eliminated for the upcoming fiscal year, and we're appreciative of that. The $136 million here is principally to use fund balance. And again, most of this happens to be in the auxiliary areas, but there are some in the um, uh, not, uh, other self-supporting areas. So that's about half of the proposed uh, remedy at this point in time. Temporary salary reductions. We are, um, we have a plan and we're announcing today that it's um, for all of our employees earning $150,000 or less, there is no impact, no temporary salary reductions, no furloughs to our employees at $150,000 and below. Above that, we will be doing a progressive incremental temporary salary reduction for the balance of the, for the fiscal year 21. And as President Pines was mentioning earlier, at the highest levels of the university, uh, the vice president's level um, up to 10%. And uh, as President Pines mentioned, he, um, he has voluntarily uh, gone to a 15% temporary salary reduction. We're very pleased, and, and as President Pines uh, had described earlier, we really listened to um, our community um, over and over from so many quarters. One of the values that came through loud and clear as we were dealing with this crisis is to protect our most vulnerable employees. And we have done so. We have done so throughout. And at this point in time, we're very pleased that this plan continues to do that. I do have to say that the future, again, is uncertain. And while this across the campus, um, temporary salary reduction is, um, the majority of, the, in terms of solving this $292 million problem, this is what we're doing um, across the board. There may be pockets within the university where individual uh, additional actions may be necessary, um, including other kinds of personnel reductions, potentially even layoffs. But as an across the board measure, below $150,000, not a financial impact at this time. The next category is operating cuts to various units. Um, most of the state uh, budget cut that we, uh, that I mentioned earlier, falls into this category. So uh, you may recall a few minutes ago, I said we received the seven and a half percent state budget cut. What we distributed for fiscal year 21 was a 5% reduction to all units. So, um, even with the state budget cut we had, we addressed some of that centrally and distributed uh, 5%. So that was uh, one of the measures and, and a, that's a structural change. There's also some structural changes in the auxiliary areas. So together that uh, accounts for about $97 million of this uh, $292 million shortfall. Facilities renewal is an important uh, item and uh, we have also made hard choices here to postpone where we can facility renewal improvements. Things that were critical or life safety related, of course, would continue on, but we've taken some reductions in our facility renewal program. And then some other central budget cuts, uh, some debt service relief, again, um, uh, through our partnership with the system, University System of Maryland, we were able to get some relief on 
some debt service on uh, projects that are funded, academic projects funded with bonds, and uh, a little bit of savings from fringe benefits. So um, uh, miscellaneous central budget savings that amount to about $20 million. So together, uh, this plan uh, seeks to address the FY21 forecasted shortfall. I should have mentioned that in our, um, our revenue projections, um, the, uh, on the auxiliary side, the significant impacts to that revenue are the de-densification of the campus. So rather than being at 100% occupancy for residence halls and the dining that goes with that, we're at uh, approximately 40%. I think most people know that uh, fall sports have been uh, postponed and we're uh, not counting necessarily on revenues. We're hopeful that fall sports uh, gets played at some point in time, but there's a revenue impact. Uh, we're taking a conservative view of that at this point in time. So these uh, remedies are intended to address um, the challenge in front of us and we're apportioning them at this point um, about a quarter toward as permanent um, actions and three quarters as temporary actions. So I think with that, um, I will turn the turn it back over to you, Brian, and look forward to uh, our questions. Great, thank you, Carlo. Thank you for that uh, very transparent presentation uh, of the budget. Uh, President Pine, I want to start, uh, start with you. Um, Carlo in his presentation talked about sal temporary salary reductions and I think judging by the number of questions in the Q&A and that were submitted in person, there was a great deal of interest in, in temporary salary reductions or layoffs or furloughs. Um, and obviously what Carlo outlined is a very modest uh, approach to salary reductions. Why was that important to you as president and why, why did the university take that approach? Uh, thank you, Brian, for the question. Um, I think it's important because I want all of our community to know that we really care about all of our employees. This is an incredible double pandemic, the virus, social unrest, and then the financial impact that it has had on families, the mental stress that families have been going through. They don't need another financial piece of stress. And I think our team, and I really commend our team, our budget team that really recommended these suggestions, is that they listen carefully to our entire community. We followed the principles of the shared guidance that we got from the Senate. We listened to all of our employee groups, and we felt that the best solution was to minimize uh, the impact to our most vulnerable employees below $150,000. We felt that really was going to help them out a lot. And as you heard articulated from Carlo, we have tried to hold them harmless in terms of salary reductions. And the most important thing I want everyone to understand, we absolutely care about our employees and their well-being and their safety and their health. And that's part of what we're doing, so. Great, thank you, President Pines. Uh, Carlo, coming back to you kind of on the, on the, on the, same, uh, on the same topic, can you just once again kind of clarify, this question is from Gene McGloin. Can you please clarify uh, the $150,000 threshold? Does that reflect base salary? Will only base salary be subject to the reduction? Uh, yes, yes, it reflects base salary. Um, so simple answer to that is yes, base salary. All right, great. Um, so, an, another question uh, from Sarah Grace. Uh, and, and a couple other people have asked the same question. If the university goes remote at any time, any point in time, does this budget change? In other words, what are the what are the assumptions that this budget mitigation strategy is, rests on? So the university has prepared for the possibility of going remote. So in terms of instruction, the rest. I mean, some of the expenses that we incurred was to prepare us for that possibility. Of course, we hope it doesn't happen. Um, our residence halls are de-densified. So I think part and parcel of that question is, are our students continuing to live on campus? If they are, then there isn't any additional uh, impact there. If they are 
leaving the residence halls, there could be some further impact, as was the case in the spring when uh, we abruptly moved to online. Other assumptions that we've made in these numbers, uh, as, I, as I mentioned briefly, we've already uh, anticipated that fall sports, while we hope that they will happen at some point during the year, we're not counting on it at this time in terms of these projections. All right, great. Carl, I'm going to stick, uh, stick with you again. This question was, uh, was submitted by Owen Ellison, uh, and it kind of gets to your uh, uh, opening remarks about what cuts were permanent and what were temporary. Uh, the question is this, the budget was cut because of COVID. Are we likely to get money back in a few years when the state and institution have a chance to recover? That's a good question. Um, and how I would address that is I would differentiate from uh, state supported activities and auxiliary activities. Uh, on the auxiliary side, uh, we certainly hope and expect that in the future, our residence halls will be full again, our uh, athletic teams will be competing again. All of the richness and excitement of being a, a vibrant college campus and uh, students, you know, swarming through the student union and riding shuttle buses and having those experience, we, we, that is, those days are going to return. We hope it's soon, but they're going to return. When they do, the revenues associated with that will come back. So in that sense, we need to get through a challenging time, but it's a temporary challenge. The state uh, budget cuts, on the other hand, are base budget cuts. Um, and to be candid, the forecast for the next fiscal year or two with the state are uh, bleak, but our state's future is tied somewhat to uh, the university and we have a robust research um, enterprise. The work that we do is an economic uh, boon to the state of Maryland. So the future in terms of uh, continued support from the state, uh, we expect that to resume but we'll be resuming from a lowered base. When a, a, a base budget cut is made in terms of state appropriation, next year's budget and the year's budget after that, start from the lowered base, not reinstating what we had previously. Can I just make a comment, Brian? So, um, and not to contradict anything that uh, Carla has said, but there may be some also misunderstanding out there related to what you may have just read yesterday or this morning in the Baltimore Sun as it relates to a surplus um, in the state's budget of 500, I think $86 million. Those are receipts that were received in the calendar year 2019 and they're addressing what has come in from fiscal 20. What Carlo is referring to is things that are gonna happen projected going forward in terms of the deficit of the state budget in the next two fiscal years. So you wonder why are we receiving a cut now? Why are our numbers gonna look bad going forward? It's because the projected cut going forward for fiscal 21 and fiscal 22 are something in the range of one to 1.6 billion in fiscal 21 at the state level. Therefore it affects us because we get the state increment. And similarly in the fiscal uh, 22, it's, it's really a big guesstimate, but somewhere between 2 billion and 4 billion, and not to really scare you all, but that's why you're gonna see us absorbing a cut today uh, based on the projections of the state's budget in fiscal 21 and fiscal 22, which is might be contradictory to what you read in the fiscal 20 surplus of 586 million in the black from, from the past year. So just so you're not confused, these are based on projections. Important clarification. Thank you. Thank you, President Pines. Uh, Carlo, uh, uh, just staying on the temporary salary reductions for one more, uh, one more question. Uh, Jack Blanchard asks, when will the temporary salary reductions begin and when will the employees be notified of their specific cut? Yeah, so, um, uh, communication from University of Human Resources is, is in draft form and will be issued in the next day or two. The, uh, because you have to work this through the payroll process, it will likely start taking effect with the pay period beginning September 27th and continue through the balance of this fiscal year. All right, great. Uh, Provost Rankin, I'm going to come to you for this, for this next one because it's a question about college and schools. Uh, this question comes from Charles Olson. Um, 
Provost Rankin, uh, are all of the College Park colleges and schools required to run balanced budgets for the fiscal year? And Marion, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, normally that is um, expected and uh, normally that it's that is done. In fact, many of the colleges have um, a fund balance, a significant fund balance at the end of the year. If a college were to um, temporarily not be able to balance its budget, we could probably sort of bail them out. And we have done that also occasionally in the past. But in general, yes, they're expected to have a balanced or even a surplus budget. Okay, thank you. President Pines, I'm going to come to you for this next one. Uh, this question comes from Jean Farrick. Uh, Jean asks, will we stick together and really help the self-support units like Student Affairs? They're working just really hard over the, over the past couple of months. You, President Pines, you need, also need to unmute yourself. Absolutely, um, Jean, thank you for the question. Uh, we are a Terrapin Strong family. And uh, the budget uh, solutions that you saw from uh, Mr. Colella are related to keeping all of our entities strong, including the auxiliaries, including student affairs. Um, we've done, I think, a measured approach into how we started uh, this uh, fall semester, uh, trying to slowly but surely uh, move to in-person, which we hope to do uh, going into next week. Um, and so we are really trying to put our employees uh, and our students experience at the highest priority next to, of course, your uh, everyone's health and safety. That's been the highest priority. But we're trying to also give our students some of the best student experience that we can possibly give in this particular time period, while also protecting uh, those employees that work um, in residence life, that work in student affairs uh, broadly. Great, thank you. Uh, this next question I'm going to uh, direct to, uh, to Cindy Hale. Cindy, go ahead and unmute yourself. This question is this. Are each department expected to cut from their budget a certain percentage? Each department, um, we have distributed a 5% base budget cut. That was done with the FY21 working budget. So units already have that number. They've built it into their FY21 budget. So. Uh, those, those plans have been built into the budgets at this point. Is that, does that answer the question, Brian? I believe it does. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Cindy. A um, uh, question from Marshawn Jackson really is, is he, he, this person's really looking ahead. What are our plans to deal with cuts in fiscal 22? Carlo, give us a sense of planning for, for next fiscal year, because as you mentioned, this is, we're likely to see multiple years of impact. Yeah, uh, obviously a very good question there. And depending on what the nature of those cuts are, again, if they are state budget cuts and they are permanent cuts, we'll have to take uh, more challenging measures. I think one of the things uh, we've been able to do in the last six months, um, the various examples of you know what I call belt tightening or um, interim measures, they have taken the slack out of the system. Um, so the, the lower hanging fruit or the things that are um, uh, a, we're able to do temporarily, we've, we've got fewer options going forward, particularly for any kind of structural cut, such as a, uh, an additional reduction in state um, appropriation. All right, terrific. Uh, President Pines, I'm going to come to you for this, for this next one from, from, from Tyra Reed. Um, what is the university doing to advocate for additional federal funding in the upcoming stimulus packages? Uh, if the federal government felt more pressure, they may award additional funding for higher ed. And again, reminder to unmute yourself. Thank you, Ms. Lee, for that question. Great question. Um, our uh, federal liaison, uh, Virginia Meehan, and her boss, uh, Ross Stern, have been lobbying this entire year on behalf of our faculty, staff, and students. And I'll give you a couple of examples. We were fortunate in the first CARES Act that we got about $21, $22 million, that about $10.7 million went towards financial support for our undergrads and graduate students. 
Um, the other 10 point something million went towards helping us uh, get ready for COVID at our university. And that was during the first CARES Act. They've been also lobbying with our uh, Maryland dele federal delegation for additional CARES money, um, which would be even more than that, which would go to again to support the financial need for our students, of course, in this time of, of great uh, unrest, as well as a financial uncertainty because of the fact that many of our students' parents um, have lost their jobs. Um, 38 million people are still out of work in the United States. Um, so that CARES Act money is really important. So they're still lobbying for that. There's an additional HEROES Act um, that the states, if that went through, will potentially also get money that would go to the state's uh, deficits. And hopefully some of that would give relief and therefore they could also fund additional money for higher education. So there's multiple strategies going forward with our federal um, delegation as also with our state delegation. So be it, be advised that, you know, Mr. Stern and Ms. Meehan are working really hard on behalf of the entire University of Maryland community. Great, Carl, I'm gonna come back to you for, the, for a question about fund balance. And, and, and the question is, what percentage of our fund balance has been used this year? How, how much do we have left? And I think that this question comes from Susan Martin and I'm gonna to add to her question. Maybe you can give us a sense of, uh, of how those fund balances accumulated and, and what the purpose is. Sure, so um, fund balance accumulation, let me start there. Uh, that's simply the financial results each year. So when expenditures within a year fall below, uh, you know, resources budge budgeted for the year, that residual accrues in various accounts. And that collectively across the campus is considered the fund balance. Um, without getting into too much in the way of accounting, um, some of those funds are in what are called plant accounts with very uh, distinctive uh, requirements. In other cases, they're carried forward. So starting the, the Fiscal year 20, I believe our fund balance was, uh, in, in aggregate, was about $550, $535 million, something in that range. Our reduction in uh, fiscal year 20 was somewhat modest uh, in the $20, $20 million, $20 million range. The plan going forward. Um, is to draw down those fund balances for those mostly to offset the revenue uh, reductions that we're seeing resulting from COVID. So that's, so I would say um, uh, forecasting through the end of the year, probably, uh, well, I, I think it was on the chart, a, a diminution of about $150 million in fund balance from our uh, reserves. All right, great. Sticking, sticking with you, Carlo, question from Warren Bryan. Will there be any reductions to benefits like university contributions to retirement plans or to tuition remission? Uh, good question. Uh, no, there will not be. As has been the case in the past, when we've had temporary salary reductions, neither uh, benefits, um, uh, be they health or retirement or tuition remission have been impacted. So for the temporary salary reductions, the uh, understanding with the University System of Maryland is all of those benefits would be protected. Great, thank you, Carlo. Um, uh, Cindy, I'm gonna come to you with this, with this next question. It's from, uh, from Don Milton. Will there be a process for being able to use DRIF that faculty have built up to allow us to be able to continue to maintain our research competitiveness? Absolutely. Uh, the drift funds uh, are in the colleges and in the academic units, and um, there is no no plan to disrupt uh, the use of drift to support research. So we we do not see that as going to be a, a significant problem for any of the researchers. All right, terrific. All right, can I just make a point on that? I, I think everyone should know that the research operation of our university has gone very well. Uh, over the last several months, and it's been wrapping up phase by phase. Um, we believe we'll, we've even maybe gained a little bit of momentum in uh, research awards, which have gone up, as you heard from my State of the Campus address, and the Vice President of Research, Lori Lacasio, along with all the faculty, have been an incredible submission of proposals. So there's a great opportunity to continue that activity, almost full bore uh, in terms of getting our research done, because yeah. we've really done a great job. 
So, uh, so Don, you should be able to really continue to submit more proposals uh, and get more return of drift back to the School of Public Health. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, Carlo, another clarification about this temporary salary reductions. W what pay period does it start and when and when and how long will it last? Is it through the end of the fiscal year? Is it a full year? Maybe you can explain that. Sure, uh, it's proposed to start with the uh, pay period that commences on September 27th. So that's where it will start to be applied and it will be applied throughout the fiscal year. So whatever pay period ends, closest to June 30th. All right, great. Uh, President Pines, I'm gonna to come to you for this, for, for this next question, and it's sort, of, it's sort of related to, 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 to the COVID testing. How much money is the university spending on the comprehensive campus-wide testing that, is, that we've been undergoing? I think it's, um, it's gonna end up being several millions of dollars to provide this service, but it's, it's a necessary uh, service that we are, provi are providing to our faculty, staff, and students, and it's very important. Um, we've done it in the phased approach. We'll be starting the second round on September, the week of September 14th. Actually, the, the first day will be September 15th. Um, but we will then, beyond the, this next round of three weeks of testing, we will then go to sort of Sentinel testing, about 1,000 tests per week. Um, and then that will still be covered as free. We'll be looking at different population groups and make sure that COVID is not, again, really being transmitted too, too far in our community. I think our team has done a really great job. And I just, this gives me an opportunity to once again, thank the University Health Center and the Vice President for Student Affairs, uh, Patty Perillo, and of course, the incomparable Safe, Dr. Sacred Bodison and her entire team. They've done yeoman's work over the last several weeks, in fact, in fact, the last five months to get us ready to be able to test our population and make sure that our community is safe. They, they deserve you know, a really um, high bar from us. So thank you. Uh, Carlo, question for you from uh, Jessica Roberts. It was announced earlier in the year that there would be a 1% COLA in January of 21. Is that still happening? Um, that is in the budget. I don't know if it's been enacted yet. So that's a question that um, uh, I don't have a, uh, an answer for at this time. It will uh, as, as I understand it, it is in the state budget and there would have to be an action to remove it to occur. All right, great. Um, next question is again, kind of following up on, on a previous question, Carlo. Does this budget and plan rest on the campus remaining open, at least partially open this semester? The, as, as we described a little bit earlier, um, we've already densified quite a bit. So, and uh, as President Pines just mentioned, our research activity uh, is ongoing. Our, uh, our instruction is ongoing, whether it stays fully, um, uh, whether it moves fully online or not. Uh, the tuition revenues are uh, dependable. I think the, and I've already mentioned with uh, fall sports, we're not counting on that revenue at this time. So unless there were um, actions that resulted in uh, significant decreases in our on-campus population, this forecasted uh, financial picture, uh, I think is a conservative uh, approach at, at this moment in time. So I, I, I you know not a, not a more loss um, anticipated uh, as a result of changing operations. All right, great, thank you, um, Cindy. I'm going to come to you for this one. Question from Lee Mundy. Lee asks, Will entirely grant supported employees be subject to the salary reduction? Yes, yes. All employees are going to be treated the same. So we are going to um, have a salary reduction. For those those individuals who supported on um, on research funds, but I, I will also mention that the majority of people supported on research funds will fall below the one hundred and fifty thousand dollar line. So most of those people won't be impacted. But if their salary is at that level, yes. Important clarification. Thank you, Cindy. Sure, important. Ma Ma Marianne. Uh, coming to you, and we've had a couple of questions that in, in the Q&A about the hiring freeze. 
Uh, this question comes from Janice Root Roby and, she, and mm -hmm. she writes, a strict hiring freeze coupled with ongoing retirements will cause a retraction of the tenure track faculty ranks. Can we expect hiring freeze exceptions to maintain excellence in our academic and research units? Yes, I think we can. I think we have to be careful with it because obviously these are permanent commitments or semi-permanent commitments when we make them. But um, we've been granting hiring exceptions based on a set of principles where there's a very strong need for um, someone for program development or um, high enrollment demands, these kinds of things. I think we will re-examine this along with the president as we go forward. Um, he has some um, agenda items uh, that he would like to support in terms of faculty hiring as well. So we're just going to have to look at the overall budget picture. Obviously, we don't want this these two or three years or whatever it's going to end up being to, to do some serious damage to major programs that we've invested in over the years. We want to keep our research efforts strong and very competitive. And, you know, so we're going to have to work with the deans and the, the chairs to make these decisions going forward. We'll, we'll have to be careful. I don't think there's any doubt about it. We can't, we're not going to be back to business as usual for a couple of years at least. But we also don't want to just sort of give up a lot of investments that we've made and, and, and not stay competitive. Great, thank you. President Pines, I'm gonna come back to you with the, the next question and we've got a couple of teleworking. This one comes from Patricia Zapeda. She writes, teleworking presents an opportunity for departments to cut costs like space, supplies, and equipment. Therefore, will teleworking be promoted this and next year for those who can fulfill their tasks remotely? Yeah, I think we've given that flexibility um, through human resources and also through our academic units to the individual colleges and the unit heads. Oh, yeah. but we, we obviously, um, you know, Patricia, have seen that teleworking for many of our employees has worked really well. They're able to do their jobs as effectively or maybe even more effectively than they were in person. This will cause us to definitely look broadly across the university to look at how the use of space and could we reassign space in various colleges and various units to other activities based on how many folks are teleworking in that particular college, that particular unit, that particular division. But indeed, it's been a benefit to, to keeping our operation going. Again, it's, however, it's up to the flexibility of the college dean on the academic side and the, the unit heads on the division side. So um, we definitely commend uh, all of our employees for being able to keep up their work by teleworking. The other challenge I want to, uh, while I have the floor, the opportunity to speak about, is the challenges that we all are very much aware of related to work-life balance issues. We know this has been very difficult and incredibly stressful for families with uh, young children, families with um, elderly parents that they have to take care of, and also those who are immune compromised. And we want to offer the maximum flexibility to all of these families. Um, as you know, our, our university partnership with the City of College Park, our Child Care Center will hopefully open if it gets its license on October 1st. Um, and there'll be slots there for, I think, about 120 uh, young children. I know it's not enough. Uh, our Chief of Staff, Michelle Eastman, and I are working to get a committee together to work on an additional child care plan. It will evolve over the next, I think, four or five weeks. Uh, hopefully we'll come up with a strategy that work for in the next semester because we know this is one of the biggest issues that all of our employees are facing. All right, great. Uh, as a reminder to everybody, uh, we, we, we've had about nearly 200 questions submitted. I, I wish we could get to all of them. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do as many as, as we can here and, and, and group them together. A, a lot of people are asking uh, very, very similar questions. Um, we will be, this session, again, as, as a reminder, was recorded and we will post it. Um, and then you can also expect a, uh, an email coming out shortly. Uh, that details some of this. And then as Carlo mentioned, an additional one that's going to go into greater detail about the about the temporary salary reductions. Um, a couple more questions uh, that I think we can, we can fit in. A couple of questions related to uh, federal tax deferral program. Uh, Cindy, I wonder if you might be able to take this one. This is specifically a question from Craig Taylor. Is the University of Maryland going to opt out of the new tax deferral program? 
Well, I'm going to bump that one to Carlos since he, um, Human Resources reports to him. Um, so go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, okay. I have to with that. <laughs> uh, now, it, it's been a topic of discussion uh, amongst the USM institutions. It is a deferral rather than a relief. So it seemed to be uh, not a, a very good option, particularly for folks who might be confused about thinking they're getting tax relief rather than deferral. So it's not uh, an opportunity that the system is pursuing. All right, great. Um, Daryl, in a minute, I'm going to let you uh, let you um, provide some um, concluding remarks. But I want to I want to end with with this, and I and I've seen this uh, written in the Q and A several times. And this one, um, I won't use her name, but this is what she writes: Amazing! I cannot believe the temporary salary reductions are only for those above one hundred fifty thousand dollars. This is a kindness that has nearly brought me to tears. Thank you a million times over. Thank you. I love Maryland. So with that, Daryl, I'd like to turn it to you for, uh, for some final comments. I mean, what, what else is more to say? We all love Maryland. Thank you for saying that. Um, you know, it makes us all feel better. Uh, the team, Cindy, Marianne, Michelle, Carlo, and so many others underneath them have worked so hard over five months to try to reconcile this financial problem, this fiscal 21 financial problem. And we're not done with it. But we did listen to our community. We listened to everybody. A lot of folks, you hear a lot of rumors on social media, you hear a lot of rumors in the press, and you, and you hear this stuff that we don't hear you. We hear you. We care about every employee at the University of Maryland. We have listened to the Senate. We have listened to the Senate Committee on University Finance. We have listened to our employee groups. We have listened very carefully. We put together a very careful financial plan. People have worked painstakingly on, this, on these issues. And the hope is that we keep our community together, moving forward to move Maryland forward. Um, so I'm grateful to, you know, I inherited the team, so I'm lucky. Um, you know, they've been doing this work before I was president. I've only been president for nine weeks. Um, so they, all, they deserve all the credit. And I'm really grateful that they made sure that our most vulnerable and most impacted employees would be protected. And I think that's what you're hearing today. And, and, and you're also hearing a message of we, we care about every Marylander, so thank you. Okay, with that, thank you very much for all 3,000 of you joining us this afternoon. Uh, more information will be coming to your email inboxes uh, shortly. Uh, and again, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you to all the panelists for presenting today. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.